Ladies and gentlemen, today is October 9th, 2013, and this is the Can Kale Show number 103, where we learn to be better artists, and today is Whatever Wednesday, and we're going to be jumping back into working on the Emma comic right over here. We're going to be working on this environment today, and we are going to be painting. Well, most of the painting has been done, but we're going to be kind of cleaning things up, as well as, uh, what else are we going to be doing? We're going to be cleaning things up. Oh, and I'm going to be revealing my process, right? Because I show you this thing over here, and you're like, well, that's all fine and dandy, but how the heck did you draw that? How the heck did you get to this point? And that question, I'm more than willing to answer. All right, so let's go ahead and just jump into it, because I've got a couple things that I need to show you. A couple of things. Okay, so many of you know that I start my drawings, I start my panels for my comic, much like this, and I work with my chalk brush. I work with the absolutely magical chalk brush uh, that was passed down to me from Riot, and I think it's actually one of the default brushes, but at any rate, I was passed down and converted to the ways of texture brushes by my friends at Riot. And the chalk brush that I'm referring to, you can also download it for free uh, on my DeviantArt page. It's basically this one right here, looks like that, and it creates all this nice texture. And that's how I go about basically blocking in not only values, but kind of like the overall idea, shapes, and composition of a piece, right? And I even do it uh, down here the same way, you know, with these characters and then this guy in the front. And this is something that I've only recently been starting to do because um, I'm starting to realize that lighting is one of my favorite things in, in just artwork and comics and stuff like that. And I really want to push it to the next level with this comic. So uh, getting the values and getting the general idea of a scene down onto the canvas in the beginning is of the utmost importance. So I like to get that done right at the beginning. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into let's jump into the time lapse. Let's jump into the learning time lapse. And I'll pause it every now and then whenever I need to. Um, but basically, what I'm doing is I just lowered the opacity on my values layer, and now I'm going through. And this is something new that I've started to do, because normally in the comic up till now, most of the backgrounds have almost kind of just been painted by the, basically like flying by the seat of my pants, you know? It's like just figuring things out as I go. But for this one, I wanted it to be very kind of like calculated and just like almost, like I wanted all the details to be laid out. Like for instance, this uh, like shipping container, this ed end of a shipping container, you know, I didn't want to it's kind of a pain in the butt to figure things out, like how things look as you're painting. And it's much easier for me to instead lay down lines, paint beneath the lines, and then go over top of it with an overpaint layer. And this is something that I was talking about in yesterday's episode, if you're curious about uh, some more techniques that I use with that. That's what I used to paint the Tristana that you guys uh, no doubt saw, or if you haven't seen it, go check it out. And so um, basically I'm just going through the entire scene, and I'm figuring out the details that I want to have in here. And this surprisingly took quite a while because, you know, like, I was like, oh, okay, well, there's there's room over here, so we got to, like, block it in. I originally thought of, like, one car being there, but I thought, ah, they can just hop the car and get around the side. It's like there should be at least, like, two cars or something there that, that would make it really hard for people to just get through their outpost. But it still looks kind of like it's just jammed, you know, into place. Like, they could just kind of, like, set this thing up on this bridge. And uh, I was also uh, doing some doing some detail on the bus over there too, and all these things I'm actually using uh, reference for as well. I just go on Google and I type in you know city bus or junkyard cars and shipping containers, and then you'll be able to easily find reference for getting the details and the inspiration that you need. So that's basically what I'm doing here. Uh, I, I'm drawing this on one screen and then on my second screen, right, for dual monitor setups. I highly recommend it for artists because it's really easy. You can throw up all of your, you can bleh, throw up all of your references on one screen and have your working space on the other one. And that makes us oh so happy. And then I thought about this, and it's funny because when I was drawing all this trash, right, like it's just like a bunch of junk just like jammed in the side here. I was like, oh man, I don't have to draw a bunch of stuff, but Really, it can just be kind of shapes. And really, just like look at what I did here. All I did was I created the outer shape of the trash, and I drew kind of like an inner shape. And there's like a barrel and a tire and you know other stuff in there. But it's actually not that hard to draw like clutter. 
I thought it was going to be a pain in the butt. I was going, oh, I got to draw like hundreds of little pieces of paper, and it's not necessarily that, right? Put detail where you want people to look specifically, but otherwise you can just get away with making shapes. You know, always fall back to that. Is sometimes you can create detail by just throwing in shapes and uh, silhouettes. And speaking of that, you're going to see me doing that with the guys here, right? Because these guys are so small on the comic page, it would be such a waste to put all this detail in, and it would look weird too, like to put all this detail into like their helmets and then all like the things on their jackets and all that stuff. It's like instead, all I'm doing is I'm just doing the outline of a man and then the outline of the bike with a couple of little details, like some very, very major details that I think will help pull it into uh, what it's supposed to look like. So, um, yeah, there's me doing Clem's bike, and it's funny because even drawing the characters this small, it's helping me figure out just how these bikes kind of scale with each character, right? Like, Clem's bike is actually pretty big, you know? It's almost like a chopper bike, but it's a, it's got, like, the two wheels. It's a chopper trike, basically, and it's got that big old cow scoop thing on the front. And it's actually really fun and challenging to figure out a way to draw, you know, detailed things in a very simplified state. A, to save time, and B, just to have it be a cohesive look throughout the entire comic. So, um, yeah, I just go about doing that, and I think we're going to be moving on to the next one here. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit, because basically all I do is I just line the rest of these bikers, and this is more of the same. So let's go ahead and move into just the rest of the lining thing. This is really actually an experimental thing. Like, normally, like I said, I don't do any lines for the background at all. I just paint it kind of as I see it. I kind of paint it in black and white first, throw a color map on it, or a gradient map on top of it, and then I just go straight into overpainting. But there was going to be so much detail in, in this one that I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get away with that. And I also thought that it was a chance for me to increase the quality of the backgrounds. Even though it might take a little bit more time, I, I felt like the sacrifice was going to be well worth it, especially in an, an establishing shot like this. Uh, I think I remember when I was taking uh, some lessons with Alvin Lee uh, back when I was working at Riot, and they paid for us to take this awesome course through schoolism with Alvin Lee. And he talked about uh, the importance of establishing shots, as well as um, I've also heard it said in awesome books such as this one, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, he talks about the importance of establishing shots. And how, you know, spending the extra time to make a nice establishing shot with like tons of detail and just the proper perspective and really just like setting the scene for where something is going to be taking place. He says it's so worth it because people will really, it's the difference between something being like, oh, okay, well, people knowing what it is and then feeling like they're there, right? So that's what I wanted to push for this. I want this comic to be super immersive. So, of course, uh, anything that I can do to make the reader feel uh, like they're really there, I'm going to try and go for it. Try my hand at it, see what happens. So now we're moving on to my favorite process of them all. My favorite process in the world, and that is lining, inking, whatever you want to call it. And it is, uh, yeah, my least favorite thing actually to do in the entire world. Um, but it takes, a lot of, it takes a lot of patience, and the brush that I use is really nice because you don't necessarily have to get the lines like perfect. It has like a little bit of texture on the sides there. I don't know if you can see that. Like normally when you're working with like a precise just round brush, everything has to be perfect. But with this brush, even just like little uh, mess ups and little things, little little flicks, they look like they're part of the style, and I really like that. It helps me speed through the the line art much quicker, and it makes the whole process and experience a little bit less like I want to jump up. <laughs> jump off this bridge, right? It makes me want to jump off this bridge much less and be that guy hanging right there. So, um, yeah, and that's always a good thing, right? It's always a very, very good thing. So this is where we're moving into the next process. What I've done is I have taken that old kind of value sketch, I've duplicated it and put it behind my lines, okay? So my lines for my thing, I they were originally blue. I darkened them, turned them to kind of like a really dark, desaturated red. And I'm just painting in values again, right? And I kind of saw with the scene, like a lot of light was going to be emanating from this uh, outpost thing. So, of course, there's going to be these really cool, dramatic cast shadows coming from the dude's feet, kind of going out towards the bikers. And this is basically where I figure out little things like that right there. See that little light that's being caught on the edge of the, the shipping container? It wasn't there before. 
See how it's just kind of like that? Watch as I paint that in, and then I just kind of leave that little extra thing there. Watch this spot right there. Okay, so I did it right there, and I also did it over here on, this, on the trash heap. And that's basically from this guy's light. Um, that's basically from the motorcyclist's lights kind of like pointing in uh, whichever direction, and they're lighting that area. And this is uh, something that I'm starting to realize is uh, it, it's so much more easy to predict and lay this out when you do lines for a background. So I'm definitely going to be doing it this way from now on whenever there's a shot that, you know, has a high amount of detail. Otherwise, I'm probably just going to do the same whole thing. If it's just like the skyline and, you know, some mountains and stuff like back here, you know, there's no need for me to put lines on the mountains, you know, or the trees and stuff like that. So, but like for structures, houses, cars and stuff like that, I think uh, I will be doing lines and stuff like that. It just makes it look so much more clean and professional. Professional. So, oh. ah, so uh, oh, someone's asking about is there a particular reason that I like to use blue? Uh, yes, it is actually a it's like a traditional kind of harken back to making comics traditionally. Uh, people would first draw their sketches in blue pencil, and then the inkers would come over top and do black, you know, over top the blue pencil. So the reason why I do it like that is just because I don't know it's cool, it's traditional, and it makes you feel awesome. So, anyway, so now what we're going to be moving into is gradient maps. Okay, so that thing that I just did right there and this interface that I'm working with right here. I have done a tutorial on this before, so if you guys are curious, please just search it. But I can give you a basic overview. Basically, what a gradient map does is I paint the backgrounds just in black and white. And then the gradient map assigns colors basically to, you know, what would be black is now this dark blue. And what would be white is now going to be this purple. See how the gradient map works and then it just assigns those colors on that, on that uh, scale from black to white. And it's a really really easy way to play around with colors, right? See look at this. It's already just like laid down a bunch of color. And now I can just kind of look at it and be like, oh, okay, does that, do I like that? I wasn't quite sure. But then I had another idea and this is another thing that I did for the first time. I thought about doing two gradient maps together. So basically what I do here is I laid out with like lots of cool or lots of warm colors, right? Lots of warm colors like orange and yellow and stuff for the tent, right? Then I erase all of it out with a mask right here. You can see me doing that right there. And then what I do is I drop in that other gradient map, which is blue, on top of it. And then I just erase out where it was before. And I actually go back in here and redo the dark gradient map. I make it all just like blue and it kind of goes to this like kind of really desaturated grayish red. And then when I put those two together, it gives us that. And I saw this and I was like, yes, that is definitely a, that's a very good starting place for a gradient map. And look at that, we didn't have to mess around with colors. We didn't have to figure out like the perfect color theory or anything. We are just like, okay, well, blue and orange are complementary. Let's see what they look like together. And let's pick some colors and just let the computer do the work with the gradient maps. And there you go. And then what I begin doing now is uh, I just kind of blend the two together, just make sure it's all looking good. And then what I start doing is I start dropping in additional colors. Now I really start going in and lighting things, right? Because it's like, okay, if there's this whitish, yellowish light and it's hitting this blue bus, you know, it's going to be kind of like a teal. And now I start going in and I really start lighting things. Like, see how that the light from this is going to be coming from Clem's bike. It's coming right across here, and it's hitting right there. And I love when painters do this. Like they just have like this super awesome contrast between the shadowed areas and then the lit areas. It always looks really, really cool. And doing it this way uh, allows you to just basically paint in the light. You know, all the shadows are already there, and then you can just paint in the color and paint in the light wherever you want it to go. And then it's a really, really easy way to just kind of finish up a scene. You get it started quickly, and then you start adding in all the little details that you want. And that is fun for everyone. For everyone. <laughs> oh, you guys are freaking awesome. He was like, that's some downright witchcraft. <laughs> yes, it is very magical. It is very magical. Yes, gradient maps are cheating, and I absolutely love it. And I will use them until the day I die. <laughs> They're freaking awesome. So, yeah. But, um... But gradient maps alone don't do the job. You've got to make sure that you add in your extra colors. You've got to add in those, those punch colors, right? The things that are really going to stick out 
and it just adds that, it just kind of rounds out the entire thing, and it looks really, really nice. And it's something that you kind of got to get used to, to be honest. Like, I don't know exactly what I'm doing most of the time. It's kind of like, okay, let's start with just like a couple complementary colors. You know, again, orange and blue. And then I just start dropping in extra colors. And then another thing that's really cool is you'll notice uh, what I did right at the beginning of this video. See how all the lines here are all just kind of like that dark red? What's really awesome is that if you go to your line layer that I worked on, remember when I drew the background? You go to that, and then you lock the pixels by hitting this little button. You can basically go through and you can color all of those lines. And so now, when they take on, I just colored them kind of like a, a lighter red. And what that does is it makes it look like it's glowing. It makes it look like your background is now coming alive. and It's not just the black comic lines on top of everything. And it really starts to kind of trick your eye into believing in the scene a little bit more. And that's really what I wanted these backgrounds to be. I wanted the backgrounds to just feel like they were just kind of like a cross between comic book and painted. And uh, sort of just give you this impression that uh, what you are seeing could be real, could be existent. And then you have the cool animated, you know, black outline characters interacting over top of it. So it looks like a, a cartoon, you know, like a good old-fashioned cartoon. So, um, yeah, all I'm doing here is just painting over stuff. I am using the Reptar brush to kind of get these hard uh, transitions right here. You'll see there's like kind of just like little textures and hard edges in it that I think just look really, really nice when you do them. So, uh, yeah, get yourself some of that. And all it is is just kind of sharpening things up, adding little details where I want them to be and just making it look good, you know, making it look uh, to the point that I envisioned it, uh, capturing that original vision. And yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I mean, oh, I really enjoyed doing this, like just how the the little light is coming through the fence right here, and I was like, oh hey, like that little streak of light can go across that car. And I put that on there and I was like, whoa, that looks really awesome. And it's really fun when you're doing it this way, because again, it's like it's painting the light in. You know, don't paint the light and then paint the shadow on top of it. Start with the shadow. Start with the shadowed version. This kind of goes back to that ambient occlusion uh, tutorial that I talked about. When you're painting your characters, start with thinking, what is the ambient light? And it's kind of like this desaturated blue with a little bit of, like, pink in it. You know, so the shadows are going to be blue. And then you can just paint the light, that streak of orange, right across whatever's going to be there. And it just looks cool. You know what I mean? It's so much easier to paint light, I think, than to paint shadow. I used to paint shadow all the time, and now I paint light. Because, um, you know, shadows usually tend to be very, kind of like just very dark, kind of desaturated. And then light is when you start seeing color. You start seeing, you know, just all, all these awesome things happening, all these transitions and, and things. And it's, it's much more important, I think, to grasp how light interacts with things rather than, you know, the absence of light. Uh, anyway, that's a mouthful. So, yeah, I'm just, uh, I think I'm just finishing things up, just doing a couple more things, and then we're going to get to where we are now, and then I'm going to go ahead and show you guys a little bit, some real-time footage. Real-time footage. So let's go ahead and pull that up. Pull that up. Okay, so um, a couple things that I want to show you guys are... Um, let's go ahead and zoom in nice and close on this, and I'll show you guys exactly what I'm talking about, like with the with the overpainting uh, stuff that I got going on. Uh, where are we? Ah, here we are. Sharpen layer. Yeah, let's go ahead and stick to the sharpen layer. So what I like about this, what I like about doing the overpaint layer type of uh, thingy, and the overpaint technique, is right. You got this brush. That basically looks like this, right? So there's no there's no halfway, there's no opacity happening with this brush. It's all just texture and it just goes right down. So what's really cool about that is you can come in here and just I like to eye drop these colors and I just like to paint edges, you know? And I like come in here and I'll just paint like the light on the that's catching on the edge of this thing. Uh, if I can actually grab that. Okay, so like that. See, and this gives it like a really cool 3D look. There's just something about it that I like. I, I just like the feeling of just cutting right into it, right? Just cut the crap out, cut that stuff out of there, and then you get a nice, cohesive-looking drawing when you're done. 
and that's really, really fun to do. And you just kind of go through. Not everything has to be perfectly painted. I actually like the fact that some of these parts still show the lines and show the, the line work. You know, it has a lot of cool, it has a lot of cool style to it. A lot of cool style. And that's what we like. We like style. So let's go ahead and get in here. We'll paint a little bit of that in. I just like it. It feels like no, it just feels magic. It feels magical. Being able to be in control of such power. So yeah, try it out for yourselves. Download the brushes. Down in the description if you're on YouTube. If you're live, then go watch another video. I put the link in all my videos because it's like one of my most frequently asked questions. Where can I get your brushes? And they are pretty awesome, so you should definitely try them out. They are pretty awesome, and I'm very lucky to be handed down, passed down the brushes, the legendary brushes, from my friends at Riot Games. So, uh, yeah, I love this guy. He's just, like, kicking back in the, in the bus. He's like, yeah, what's up? Chilling. This is chilling over here. He's not even threatened. He's not threatened by the biker gang. He doesn't care. He don't give two craps. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, most of this stuff was done. Because, to be honest, I, I like having it. I'd rather have it done properly than have to, like, try to do it on stream and, like, risk the chance of messing up. Because <gasps> mm, I never do that. I never mess up. So... It's just better that I show you when it's done and do the time lapse and then you know show you a couple details and then we can move on to stuff that I'm a little bit more comfortable, confident with. If you catch my drift. Okay. So that's basically all I do. I just come back through here and just paint in shapes. Just kind of clean things up and give it that nice, cool, crisp graphic feel. And then it ends up with something really cool. Here's here's what it looks like without the sharpened mask, just to show you. This is without any of the overpainting at all. And then this is what it looks like with it. See how it just kind of softens everything and you add in some more colors, you know, wherever you want them. You know, just add some more detail and you start to just kind of figure things out. You just get things a little bit more detailed and things just seem to pop. Things just seem to pop out a little bit more at you. And that is good. All right. So next up, let's go ahead and just uh, color these biker dudes. And I'm going to open up the chat for question catapults. I've been going for, oh, I've been going for 25 minutes. Excellente. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead and pull up a character mask. And let's start lighting. Lighting the characters. And it's very easy. Very Lighting the characters is like the easiest thing in this comic. Because all it is is just a soft brush. And you just kind of tag the edges of where you, wherever you want light to be. Simple, no? Very simple, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's easy. That's easy. That's easy. That's easy. That's easy. Okay. So, but also, there's some more light coming from the other side. Some of these bikers will have their lights shining on these characters from the other side. So, uh, let's make sure we're showing that as well. Okay, so this guy is going to be hitting this guy's bike like that. See how cool that is? You just light that. That's what I'm talking about. That's why it's so fun to paint light. Because it's just like, okay, uh, this guy's headlight's going to go bam right there. and Boom! Look at that. Look how simple that was. And you're like, all right, well, that was easy. This guy's headlight's probably going to be touching just the edge of Clem's uh, thing there. The edge of Clem's uh, cow scoop. And then this light is going to be affecting the back of this guy. And a little bit of the edge of that guy. going to be a little bit of reflected light there. And that's pretty good. I'm feeling pretty dang good about that. Probably a little bit of reflected light there, too. Yeah, why not a little bit there? Uh, not so much there, but that's good. All right. Um, next up, what I want to do is let's paint in the lights. Let's paint in the lights. That way we can actually see where, um, like, because the this is being lit by that guy's bike, or Clem's bike, rather, right? One of the bikes is lighting it, so we gotta make sure we paint in those lights. We must paint them in. Uh, so let's do that. Let's 
go ahead and do one of this. One of these. Let's make sure we are labeling our layers accordingly. Okay, so he's got a light. He's got a light. Uh, he's got a light. That mask should not be existing there, or there, or there, or there. We need to get rid of some of these masks. That should not be existing there. These are supposed to be open. Open and free. Let's just magic wand it. Let's fairy godmother it. Boom! Boom, baby. Oh, I almost forgot about that guy, too. All right, that's more like it. It's more like it. All right, so now let's move on to the bloom. Let's move on to jabloom. Jabloom. Okay, so to make bloom, I just go above the lines, make a layer called bloom. Yes, you must name it that, otherwise it won't work. Set the layer style to hard light. Then you go ahead and pick yourself a soft brush. Zoom in on in there. And go ahead and paint a little bit of that color. This is the same color, same uh, kind of yellowish that I used to paint the light bulbs. In fact, it kind of tends to work a little bit better if you drop it a little bit towards orange. So if you were to go a little bit more like that, it seems to work a little bit better. I don't know why, it just, just does. Do not question. Do not question what works. Or should you? Actually, no. I take that back. You should question what works. See if you can improve upon it. Always question what works. Okay, so just a little bit. Just a little bit of bloom on that, as well as here. I might actually end up going in and doing a little bit of an overpaint thing. Because they're also supposed to have red lights on the back. And some of these guys don't even have those. So if it looks weird, I'm probably going to change it. Or if it looks weird, I'm probably just going to overpaint it. There we go. So you can do something like that. You know, just kind of do a little bit of a streak outward. Just kind of erase it. So, And then there you go. Now you have some cool lights. And this guy's light is going up there. Whoa. That's a little bit too much. A little bit too much. But now you know what it looks like when you go a little bit too hard. Okay, um, let's do the red lights, and then we're done. Uh, lights, lights, let's go back. Either. In the meantime, I would like to open up question catapults. Please cast your questions over the castle walls, and I'll send them back to you on a bed of rice. That makes me really want sushi. Mm, albacore tuna on a bed of rice. I want it so badly. But please, any questions that you have? Um, let's see here. Someone's asking, uh, Reptar as in Rugrats? Yes. Yes, that is Reptar, just like Rugrats. And the reason why I call it the Reptar brush is because it looks like him. Seriously, look, look at this. You see that? He, look, that is totally Reptar. That is a Reptar brush. It's the best. The best. That's another frequently asked question. Why do you call it the red tar brush? I have to draw a diagram or something. <laughs> Crazy PayPal. Crazy. Who did it we go? 30 minutes. Let's do this thing. Red lights. Red lights. Red lights look really cool with the bloom on it. I will tell you that. I will tell you that, and you're about to find out. See for yourself. So let me say, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah? Check this out. Oh, whoa. Nice. Well, hey there. Hey there. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and do that before it gets any more suggestive. There we go, there we go, a little bit there, a little bit there. See how wonderful the hard light layer option is? It makes our lives oh so happy, and it makes everything look cool. In fact, we just put hard light on everything. Hard light everything. 
Now you can see the characters see from that to this. It just it comes alive. It looks so cool. It looks so cool. And that is why you should use it at home. It's good for children. Children. It's safe for children. All right. Um, uh, Hate92 is asking, when coloring, do you go dark, add lights, or the opposite? Uh, yes, you may have just joined us, Hate, but this is what I was talking about. I love to start with shadows. I love to start dark, start dark, and then add lights on top of it. I just feel like it's so much more natural because when lights become involved, that's when the color and all the awesome things come out. So you might as well paint those instead of painting shadow. All right. Um, hmm. Next up, in regards to your Facebook page, this is being asked by Loopy Paladin. Are you okay with us submitting our works in progress? And if so, could you give us your feedback on them? Uh, I can't guarantee that I can give feedback on everybody's pieces of work because you guys are awesome and there's so many people like submitting stuff to the Facebook already. Uh, however, I will, I do make sure to look at them and like every single one of them, as well as I post a comment if it's something that I really enjoy. Like if you do something of Metal Slug or Crash Bandicoot, Earthworm Jim, stuff that I like, you're basically guaranteed to get a comment on it. Or if it's just something really awesome, I'll definitely comment on it. But I cannot guarantee. Works in progress. I don't care what you post on that thing. If it's awesome and you like it, please share it with us. Please share it with us because it makes me oh so happy. It makes me oh so happy. <laughs> Dordua is asking, oh, uh, is there a place for us to post art for people that don't use Facebook? Uh, you guys can go to the Emma Forum. If you go to Emma Comic Online right here and you click on the little forum thing, there is a posting place there. for. It's called Artisan's Corner, and you can uh, post your art on there. And I am going to be being more active on the forums very soon, and I've got some cool ideas planned for that. All right. Um... <laughs> oh, good question coming in from Graphics6. And this is going to be the last... Wait a minute. Yes, this is going to be the last question. <laughs> Sorry, I could not get to everybody's question today. But he, uh, Graphics is asking, what do you think of Bill Watterson's decision to remain a non-public figure? I think it's pretty freaking awesome, to be honest, because uh, I think that he he's a classic example from what I've seen of his work. He's been so inspirational. Like when I saw Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin and Hobbes is what Bill Watterson makes, for those of you who don't know. And uh, I don't know exactly how he managed to not become a public figure or what he did to be like, no, I do not want, I do not wish to be known. I do not wish to be famous. I don't know what he did to do that, but that's freaking awesome that he just decided to stick to uh, his passion and his love for the work. And I really kind of, I resonate with that too, because it is, it is always tempting to just be like, oh, I just want to be known by everybody. I want everybody to love me, right? But very quickly, you understand that, you know, fame and power and just having the respect of others can leave you with a very hollow victory if you don't, you know, stay true to yourself and you don't, and you kind of lose the vision of why you even started a project in the first place. And uh, it's totally apparent with all the Calvin and Hobbes and everything that Bill Watterson has worked on that he had passion and he had the, he was doing it for the right reasons for the whole time. So I think that's really awesome. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and end. We can probably talk a little bit more about that tomorrow too. Or, or have we? I can't remember if we've already done a Thoughtful Thursday on that. Oh, well, whatever. I'll come up with something awesome. Anyway, you guys have a great Wednesday evening. I'll see you tomorrow for Thoughtful Thursday. People on YouTube, thumbs up if you like it. Thumbs down if you don't. Thanks again for joining me live. I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, take care.